are photo references I got that were public domain images and I'm using them to help me create a watercolor Luna Moth. I'm using a light green coal erase to sketch out the Luna Moth and I know it's not super clear but that's because I didn't want the lines to be super obvious in the final artwork. I wanted them to be subtle so the original sketch has to be kind of light. It's worth noting that coal erase pencils are not completely erasable, just mostly erasable. So if you draw lightly, you can mostly erase from them. And it's very nice to be able to draw in different colors rather than always drawing in smudgy gray graphite. I'm using multiple erasers. I'm using a larger eraser when I'm erasing a large area. And I'm using a much smaller mono zero when I'm doing a very small detailed area of erasing. I advise using multiple erasers for multiple tasks. The other one I advise you get is a kneadable eraser, which can lighten lines and be changed into specific shapes rather than completely erasing something. It's especially useful if you're using graphite pencil and need to lighten an area rather than completely erase it. I'm looking at the anatomy as well as the geometric shapes and forms of the creature I'm drawing. It's more of a direct copy from a photo reference, although I didn't make it absolutely identical to the one photo reference I used as the main base, but I made it very similar. And because it was a public domain image, it wasn't such a huge deal to copy more directly. So I'm using my watercolor swatches in my two watercolor palettes to compare what colors I think are the most useful as base colors. I'm thinking about it and doing an extra step of using a separate piece of paper in order to work out colors. Rather than going directly on the final piece of paper, I'm making sure to use a test paper to test out colors. The paper I'm painting on is super deluxe mixed media paper by the B paper company from my sketchbook and so in my sketchbook I'm also testing out the colors on a random page. I'm using this as a swatching and test color page. I'm using the wet on wet technique here by wetting an area of the wing and then putting wet watered down versions of the palest form of the color in those wet areas. The watercolor paint will therefore only flow in areas that is wet I'm making the vague subtle shapes of the veining and lining on the wings, but I'm focusing here on the lightest color. You should also always remember that the paints usually dry even lighter than they go down, so these colors here aren't even meant to be as dark as they look now. Right now I'm focusing on doing all the brightest, palest areas. While it's still wet, I'm going in with more of a yellowish green tone to get the various hues in of the wing. I'm working in layers and allowing it to have drying time between layers and sections as well. Here I'm working out the very palest yellowish tones in the white areas and on the antenna. This is me coming back after I let that layer that I just did completely dry. The Luna Moth is mostly a lime green semi-translucent winged with a white body creature, but they can be slightly more turquoise in tone if they're from the first or second generation in the year and more yellowish or yellowish green in tone if it's from the last generation of moths for that year. There are also some gender and regional variances that change the appearance slightly. It's good to do your research and use the reference that you like the best. I'm now layering on the second layer of color, making sure to leave gaps and flowing areas in order to show the sections of the wing. Because everything is broken up into segments if you look at the moth, however, the wings still have this kind of translucent and subtle lining on them, so the veins need to be a little more subtle than if they were harshly outlined. Some butterflies and moths seem to have harsh outlines between the segments, but the Luna Moth has them as a very subtle thing, so make sure to pay attention to that. It really depends on which creature you're drawing and painting, so you need to pay attention to the individual characteristics of that creature. A Nearctic Saturnid moth of the family Saturnidae, also called the giant silk moth family. A large moth with a wingspan of 114 millimeters, which is 4.5 inches, but can get as large as 178 millimeters, which is 7 inches. At the northern end of their range in Canada, they often only have one generation per year, whereas further south in the United States, they tend to have two to three generations in a single year. Their larvae, or caterpillars, use clicks and vomit as a defense mechanism against predators. The long tails have now been proven to confuse the echolocation of predatory bats, which is why they have them. 
The larvae are green, mostly, and sometimes have bright spots of various colors. They change a reddish-brown right before turning into a cocoon. The eye spots in the adults are one per wing, and as you know, moths and butterflies have four wings, though the wings layer on top of each other and tend to flap more together. Here's a spot where I waited for the previous layers to completely dry before continuing. As you can see, I'm working more on the middle tones now, but I'm not worrying about the darkest tones yet. Sometimes you need to go in and do some of the darkest tones just so you understand the value range and can do a better job, whereas other times you can easily layer it up from lightest to darkest. I'm putting in the dark brown on the wing and on the top of the eye spots. Sometimes the eye spots on Luna Moths actually are more of a black and other times they're a slightly lighter brown. I personally think the eye spots barely look like eyes in any context on Luna Moths and look far more like someone cut a seed in half and were looking at the inside of the seed. So I don't think they were very successful at evolving spots that really look like eyes per se. Luna Moth is my favorite species of moth and one of my favorite of all the Lepidopterid or butterfly and moth family. I also really like the atlas moth and hawk moths of various species. Moths in general are really beautiful animals and people shouldn't only pay attention to butterflies, I think. I'm actually using some drier brush techniques by painting with a drier paint on a drier paper or a mediumly wet paint. Here I decided rather than doing too much texture techniques, I would go in with a wetter paint and fill in a more of a flat base tone with some texture to it. Eventually this will be layered up and get darker and darker. In order to purposely add some dark texture in, I used a sponge and some very dark colors mixed together. I decided to go over the entire branch with more of a dark medium tone because I decided I ended up wanting the tree branch under the moth to be even darker than on the reference photo. I was originally going to copy it as a very pale barked tree, but as I wanted this picture to look more like it was at night, and I also wanted slightly higher contrast than in the original photo, I decided to go with a darker tree branch underneath. So now, filling in the palest tone meant that the palest tone had to be much darker. It's important when you're not doing some sort of art challenge to use the correct brush for the correct job. I used a larger brush to fill in larger areas, and I intentionally made it a little rough so that I could actually get kind of a bark texture in there. And I went back over and around the edges with a much smaller round brush so that I could get up to the edges of things. It's also okay to me if there's some variance in the paint, which is something watercolor likes to do anyway, because there should be various shadows, shades, and things going on in it anyway. I'm using a dark paint here. The paint I'm now using is Dr. P.H. Martin's Hydrus Liquid Concentrated Watercolor because I wanted much more dark and vivid paint than the average watercolor paint. But each color and each brand varies greatly. I find it's good to have a mix of watercolors because you can mix them all together. Ordinarily, I would finish this painting off as a mixed media, but as it was request, my first YouTube video request, I decided I really had to make it almost entirely watercolor, aside from the initial sketch done in light green coal erase. I may still finish off this painting later with colored pencil and maybe even a little bit of gouache to make it even better in my opinion. As you can see, I'm layering it on, but you can do texture with watercolor, so don't be afraid to use different brushes and to have the paint be a little dry if you want to intentionally get texture in there. I'm making sure to get the shadows very accurately. They are darker here than my in my reference photo because I made the entire branch underneath darker, so keep that in mind. If you change the color or darkness of something you're copying from reference, you also have to change the color, quality, and darkness of the shadows. I'm just hand painting in a bunch of different major lines in the bark, but I had to wait for things to completely dry before moving on. That's another thing to remember with watercolors. Don't get impatient. Make sure you leave it alone and let it completely dry. If the paint isn't super wet or it's not crazy hot like it's been lately, you can use a hair dryer or a heat gun to force the paint to dry faster if you want to keep painting. Otherwise, I do recommend you set it aside. If you're still in the mood to do art, you can work at two paintings at the same time and switch between them. If you want to work on watercolors very badly because you're just in the zone, you have one painting, then when it gets to the point where it's no longer safe to keep painting, set that aside and pick up the other painting. By the time you've switched back and forth between the two paintings, the other one should be dry. 
As you can see, I'm adding texture in with sponges. I recommend getting a set of natural sponges. You can use them with watercolor and acrylic, and there's no reason not to use the same sponges with both, because if acrylic paint accidentally dries in your sponge, that's still a surface that watercolor can stick to well enough to use the sponge for texture. I just got this set of four or five natural sponges with various tones for about $5 at Walmart, so I'm sure you can find one somewhere for a good deal, and you really only need to buy them once unless you lose them. I keep them right in a bin that I keep all of my watercolor brushes with so that I don't lose them. Here I'm adding additional depth in the shadows of the branch. Now I wanted this branch to be fairly dark, but I didn't want to make it too dark. So I went over everything here and added some subtle details. I'm making a slightly darker mix of the slightly turquoise lime green and going over and adding some subtle details that I noticed in the photo. I'm darkening things up. Now the Luna Moth is actually kind of glowy white around the edges and the body is very white. So I really tried to capture that by making the background a bit darker than in the reference photo in order to up the contrast and encourage everyone looking at it to notice that the moth looks almost like it's glowing. Which is what the moth tends to look like if you actually see one in real life. And now a few last second flat cracks. They don't eat as an adult, they only have vestigial mouth parts, they eat only as a caterpillar and build up fat reserves they live off of once they are mature. They can eat things as a caterpillar that are often toxic to other species, such as walnut and hickory, and can feed from several trees. But as they're not super common or overpopulated, they actually live in balance with their environment and don't harm it in any particular way. One last look at the Luna Moth here. They take two to three hours for them to inflate and harden their wings before they can fly. And breeding females release very strong pheromones that males can sense from up to three miles away. Here's a short animation I did as a practice and test run, learning to animate in Clip Studio Paint. And I'm working on the new animation opening and ending, which I hope to have ready soon for upcoming videos. I hope you look forward to future videos, and as always, constructive criticisms, questions, comments, and suggestions are always welcome. More videos every Wednesday. I hope you look forward to them very soon. Goodbye!